Okay, we will continue with our theme that we talked about a few weeks ago, Body by God, and this will be part two. Ephesians 4, 1 through 6, when we last discussed this, the theme was unity in the church. Of course the church is not the four walls in the building, the church is the people, not only in this room, but all Christians everywhere in every time, okay? We talked about how we had different organs in our bodies, and that those organs, when they work together, they create something called homeostasis, which is your body systems working together to keep you alive. And that when homeostasis is disrupted, failure happens, right? Um, this is the model. We looked at these words in detail that Paul the Apostle gave us to help us understand when we're in God's presence, humility is what develops. You don't learn humility in a book. You learn it in God's presence. Moses was the humblest man that ever lived, and he spent the most time in God's presence. There's something about that. And then gentleness flows out of that in our relationships, and then there's this idea of patience, right? And that God didn't want us to just be patient, but it was supposed to be something continual that continues to happen. It's repetitious. But the goal was not to make it only repetitious. The goal was to have it be contiguous, touching sides, so that... There's never a moment in which we're not patient. That's not going to happen on this side of heaven. We all know that. But it is what we're supposed to shoot for. And I want you to imagine a place that we create where everybody is practicing this idea of patience and forgiveness with each other. It's going to be a good place because we're not going to shut down on each other. We're going to continue to feed each other. Okay. Finally, you have the idea of love. As said is God's Old Testament love where... It doesn't even make any sense how God would still continue to bless Israel after their idolatry and sin, and yet he does. New covenant comes out of the old covenant. Agape is the word of this unconditional love in the New Testament, and we see that hesed love and agape love in Jesus' death on the cross, and it makes sense how much he actually loves us. And that love, once we get it, it spills over into our relationships here. Now it changes to unity in our beliefs, and we have to ask this question. If we're unified in our love for each other, does it really matter what we believe about God? What did the people in this story believe about God in the Tower of Babel? They were totally unified, world unity, and God had a problem with it because their unification was with each other and it was not with God. They had pushed God off of the scene, refused to obey him, but we're unified together. The greatest good in God's mind is not world unity. It's putting him first. And from that, unity is what's supposed to follow. There's a, a man named Thomas More, and he's been retranslating the four gospels and other books. I'm not gonna read the whole thing here, but there's one sentence I wanna point out. In his reinterpretation and translation of the Bible, he says, says Thomas More strips the Gospels of their theological agendas. Theological means theology. It means the study of God. Who gave us the Gospels? They came from God. It's God's story, right? Now, how are you going to take God out of God's story and be left with what he says on the top line in this fresh and life-giving translation? I don't think you can give us life if you take God out of God's story. Why does he even write a a gospel of John, this man, why doesn't he just write a world unity book? Because he'll lose all the Christians and he needs everybody involved. So he wants to use catchphrases like gospel to try to tune us all in and subtle craftiness to point us away from God and onto this idea of world unity. It's not right. It's not God's way as we saw a Tower of Babel. Our text then today deals with how we come together and how we share beliefs and how we come to the same understanding with each other. Ephesians 4, 7 through 13, if you want to follow along in your own Bible, I'm reading from the NASB here. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and he gave gifts to people. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is he himself also who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. 
and he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure, the stature, which belongs to the fullness of Christ. That's a mouthful, I know. So we're going to cover this in uh, three different sections here. The who. Who did God give these gifts to? The what. What gifts did God give? And the why. Why did God give these gifts? So now we're going to turn to who did God give these gifts to? In a simple answer, it says here, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Everything that you're going to see after this is given to the Ephesian church, each one of those individuals, and to us here who are Christians. It's a gift for the church. What gifts did God give? We'll spend most of our time in this section right here. But to each one of us, grace is given according to the measure of Christ's gift. This is not grace for salvation. That is discussed in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And it's not our individual gifts which are described in different places in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 12, for example, Romans 12, 1 Peter 4, perhaps. But these gifts are actually people. They're not things. So it says here in verse 11, and let me stop for a second. I have carved out verses 8 through 10 because Paul's got a parenthetical statement there. If you come back on October 31st, where we're going to deal with demonic entities and things of that nature, that's what that is talking about. That's what we're going to come back to on the 31st, which is most appropriate to talk about Satan's defeat on that day. But we're going to go down to verse 11 here, and it says, And he, Jesus, gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers. Notice he doesn't give gifts. He gives people. He's not giving things. It's not the gift of prophecy. It's a prophet. See that? So that's a little different than what you read in 1 Corinthians 12. Who have we seen performing these roles before? Throw some answers out there. Moses? Okay, perhaps. Yeah. Anyone else? New Testament, maybe? Okay. Yes? Let's start here. Apostle, as my Father has sent me, so I send you. Prophet, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown. Evangelist, I must preach the good news. Pastor, I am the good shepherd. Teacher, do not be called teacher for one is your teacher. Who, of course, are we talking about? We are talking about Jesus. Jesus has already fulfilled these roles in a divine sense. And to look at Jesus in these roles is to learn these roles better and what they mean, okay? Now, this is commonly called the five-fold ministry in a lot of people's um, presentations. So it's the five-fold ministry declassified. We're going to go through each one of these and find out what they mean and how they apply to us. Profile number one is the apostle. So the definition is an ambassador. It's a sent one. In Jewish thinking, before Jesus came on the scene, their definition for it was an apostle is as the man himself. So if I go on behalf of somebody else, I go with their authority. It's the most authority that you see in any role on earth, an apostle. Apostles in the New Testament function with the authority of apostles, or prophets rather, in the Old Testament. So in the Greek world, a prophet was someone who spoke under the inspiration of any spirit. So if somebody said they were a prophet, we don't know what religion or what source that comes from. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the Holy Spirit. So it seems that the definition Jesus gave them as apostles and not prophets was to make sure we understand we're talking in Christian terms, those following Christ. So the word apostle is selected for the highest authority in the church instead of prophet. Now, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, all of them have a calling at the beginning of those books in the Bible. And what you see in Paul the Apostle he says things like, I was set apart from birth to be an apostle. And what did Jeremiah say? God said, I've called you from your mother's womb. The same language in each of these three prophets starts off how Paul is called. But Paul is not just called an a prophet. He is an apostle. See? Now, the qualifications are simply this. 
you had to have seen Jesus after his resurrection. You had to be an eyewitness of what you're talking about and gotten that commission from him. You performed miracles that were humanly impossible to validate they were sent by Jesus. So a level one apostle, we're gonna say, is one of the official apostles sent to bear an accurate witness to Jesus, one who does miracles and had seen the resurrection. Now, apostle can be something a little more general, and we shouldn't trip on this definition or combine the two. It simply means one who is merely sent on behalf of another. So when my wife sends me to Kroger for bread, I am her apostle to Kroger, right? The first level one is decommissioned. That role has been fulfilled already when the apostles died off, and I'll tell you why in a moment. But there are no apostles in that sense today. You will hear people in churches say, well, this is apostle so-and-so. I hope they mean something different than what this means because there's no more apostles now. That role has been fulfilled. So what about the prophet? The definition of a prophet is a foreteller and a fourth teller. Foretelling is to tell the future. So I get information from God and I dispense that out to somebody else. They don't know that's gonna happen. I've gotten that from God. But forth telling is different. That's when I take God's word and I apply it to a situation in somebody's life. The prophets like Isaiah were very corrective to Israel's behavior, and that's forth telling. So I'm going to take some liberty here. Not everybody in the Christian world in seminary level or academics anywhere always agrees on what these ministries look like. So I'm gonna tell you what, what I'm going after here. The prophet in this role is linked to what an apostle is in the New Testament. So what I'm submitting is that every single one of these apostles have a prophetic role as well and serve as prophet. If you look at John, he's clearly an apostle. But what's Revelation all about? The end times. He talks prophetically about things yet to come. And so you can clearly see that John is apostle and he is prophet. Okay. So level one, the role of prophet is linked with the role of an apostle and it is to confirm the apostolic witness. It is paired with discerning of spirits, which is 1 Corinthians 12. Whether that gift is still in use or not, that's a different sermon. Here's what we want to say about this gift. When a prophet would show up before the New Testament was written and say, I've come from Jesus to tell you all this information, how would they know whether these were really sent by the apostles or they're just speaking by some other spirit or for some other agenda? Well, a person who had the discerning of spirits would point out not whether or not their information was wrong, but what spirit they were speaking through, whether that was from God or whether it wasn't. And that's why those gifts were important in the first century before we had a written text of the Bible. Level two, a Christian who prophecies under the influence of the Holy Spirit, but whose words are to be tested against the written message or with the gift of discernment. You know, 1 Thessalonians 5, before you get to 17, it says, don't quench the spirit, but let people prophesy. Let them speak what they believe God has put on their heart. But test what they say. You don't go with everything that people say when they want to give you a word from God. It is most inappropriate to tell somebody, thus saith the Lord, and then say a bunch of things about their life. You don't know that you're hearing from God. God's text is already written. All I can do is say, I think God is telling me something, and I want to share this with you. And then you can validate whether that's accurate or not, because you have a Bible now, right? This role is decommissioned, and I'm talking about the first one where prophet is paired up and linked to an apostle. It's no longer here. But this other idea where God can speak messages through each other potentially, and I don't want to get weird on you, I just want to let you know, God might be a little more active than we think he is, but you still don't go with what everybody says. We're not to be led by prophets today the same way that you followed Isaiah's words back then or any of the apostles, just to be clear. Now, an evangelist, this seems a little easier, but not so much. It's one who proclaims the good news of the gospel truth and the purpose. This is how the apostles got the word out to the whole world at that time. It's not enough to just go out and preach the Bible. You've got to be sent by an apostle. You've got to make sure that you're saying exactly what needs to be said. And you needed God's spirit for that in a special way. Think of Samaria where Philip went. Philip was an evangelist. Philip is not the same Philip there that was an apostle. He's just a deacon. He's just a guy filled with God's spirit. However, being called into that role of an evangelist, he is sent by the apostles and must speak only what they tell him. 
He also did miracles, by the way, and laid hands and healed many people. So it was validated that what he was saying was true. One serving as an official role of an evangelist authorized by the apostles to proclaim the truth of the gospel to a particular region, authorized by the apostles. But there's another level too. Billy Graham is not actually an, uh, an evangelist in the terms of this first century group here, but Billy Graham did evangelize and brought tons of people to Jesus. So the gift of evangelism is on him while he does not fulfill that first century role of an evangelist. Any Christian who evangelizes independently or under the local church body and under the authority of scripture, as opposed uh, to being under an apostle, is kind of like a level two. The first level one is decommissioned. There are no apostles sending people out. But when you and I receive the word of God and we're reading it and we go ahead and tell other people about Jesus, we are doing the work of an evangelist. Timothy was not an evangelist, but Paul said do the work of an evangelist. Okay, So here's how this is going to look on paper. Around AD 33, Jesus resurrects. All four Gospels have him commissioning his 11 disciples, Judas is not there at that time, on what he wants them to do. Wait in Jerusalem, the Spirit will come upon you, you will be empowered for ministry, to give witness to who I am, to bring everybody back to me. He commissions the apostles, and I'm linking these two together. There's also the evangelist and the pastor and teacher as well. I have pastor and teacher linked because most academics see these two words here as one in the same role a teaching pastor or a pastoring teacher, but not necessarily two different roles, which makes our fivefold ministry really a fourfold ministry. Now, because these two are linked, the apostle prophet role is empowering the evangelist to go out, empowering the teacher pastor role to do his teaching and leading. So Paul can tell Timothy the direction and Titus the direction that he wants them to go and what he wants them to say. Now, there's a point in time in which they went on to glory and there were no more apostle prophets. Did we lose all authority at that point? How do we know people are speaking the truth? Well, in Ephesians 2.20, if you back up, it says that the church is built on the foundation of the holy apostles and prophets. You'll notice that the word apostle comes first. So we're talking about apostles and New Testament prophets, not the Old Testament prophets here. Jesus is the cornerstone. They are the foundation. Once you put a foundation down, you build your house on top of that, but you don't add another foundation to that. So once that past tense here was laid, we now knew exactly what we needed to believe as Christians, and that is what we need to teach people. Jude says he wants us to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Once, before the first century ended, everything that we needed to know about how to be saved and be in relationship with God and what Jesus did for us was already known and dispersed. So that body of truth, those beliefs were known. Before AD 90, 95, pretty much all that was written. And around those times is when all of these people went on to glory. But the pastor teacher role continues on. The question is, what are they teaching? What am I teaching right now? Well, this is how we got our written text, the Bible. Everything that the apostles taught goes into these texts that they sent to the churches and proclaimed as evangelists themselves, and now we have that in our Bible. That Bible does the same function as what the apostles did and the prophets did. So that is where we need to have our focus right now, as opposed to looking to a person to get truth. Make sense? Okay. We're looking a little confused. I just want to make sure this is tying together. I know it's very technical. Because we have Bibles now, and this is truth, that is how the role of pastor and teacher can continue on and know that they are being accurate. It all is about interpreting the Bible correctly, right? Now, these are where I want to spend most of our time because these are the active roles in our churches today, pastors and teachers. There are pastors and there are teachers separately, but let me start here. The term is shepherd. And it has the shepherd sheep image of the Old Testament. Think of David in Psalm 23, right? Um, a pastor, without exception, must be a teacher. There are no pastors that are not teachers. It is a requirement to be a pastor. It is the most important role in the local church because these are the tone setters. 
as the pastor is, as will the church be. Because if we're following the leadership, following the messages, following the interpretations, following the direction, that is what we essentially become when we start to duplicate in our homes and in the world. So how the pastor functions is very important. The role itself, to feed the flock with spiritual food, green pastures, still waters from Psalm 23. When a shepherd leads sheep, like this one here, and I wanted to show you, he does actually have legs under there. He didn't see that. The pastor is responsible, or the shepherd, to lead him to the best grasses that are there. Nothing that would make sheep sick. Sheep are very easily sickened, and so you've got to be careful where you lead them. In a Bible sense, you would say the right teaching. Green pastures would represent good Bible teaching, right? That's where a pastor should be leading the flock. What about still waters? Sheep will not drink from fast moving water. That water has to go in a little eddy up in a cove area. And when it's pools around there, that's where they'll go drink from. But they're kind of nervous and skittish, so they won't go right up to a fast moving river. The pastor's job is to take biblical truth and to break it down into easy to understand chunks that people can understand who don't have the technical training that a pastor might have. Protecting the flock from spiritual danger. This is a very interesting thing here. Jesus referred to himself as the door, right? And oftentimes we think of Jesus as the door to heaven. That's not necessarily what's being talked about in that passage. Um, shepherds, especially in Jesus' time, would build mud brick enclosures, sometimes as big as this room, sometimes smaller, depending on the amount of sheep that they had. And they'd be four to six feet tall. And there would be an entrance way where all the sheep would go in and all the sheep would go out. And instead of having a door there where you would put the sheep in there and then go to sleep overnight and then come back out, the shepherd himself would sit in the doorway and he would sleep there. The message was, if you're gonna steal a sheep over my dead body, and that is, yes, that is Jesus, right? That is exactly what Jesus is doing. You will not get to my sheep. If you follow John chapter nine, you'll see how this all flows together in chapter 10. The pastor's job is to protect the sheep, to put his own neck on the line before they get injured and harmed. It's a very important role. There's a lot of spiritual danger out there and the sense of ideas that are wrong to take us away from God. Now, nobody's going to be taken away from God if you're a Christian because the Holy Spirit will keep those that he's given new life to. But we don't want to be deceived in the process of moving all around, which is what our text in Ephesians 4, as it goes on down, discusses. We talked about Thomas More earlier. That's the kind of ideas that we need to be very careful from. A pastor seeks the flock when they stray away. Jesus told a story about 99 sheep. What is there, like 80 people in here right now? 60, 70? There would be more sheep in Jesus' story in this room than there are people right now. That's a lot of sheep. I can easily see somebody saying, if you got 99 and you lose one, is that a big deal? You still have 99. That's a lot of meat, right? Or if you don't eat them, you sure, right? But either way, in Jesus' mind, every sheep is distinctly valuable. And he leaves all 99 in the safety of a caretaker so that he can go after that one, fighting wolves, bears, whatever it takes to get that sheep back. That's how much each sheep is important to Jesus. The pastor must go after each person in that same manner. There are no excuses. This is the role. Quality over quantity. I'm not in favor of big churches. I don't want to judge you if you are from a big church or you think it's okay, I'm not, I'm not gonna get into that. But I wanna say that the bigger the church is, the care level can go down because the pastor is not able to interact with all the people to know where they're really at. To do that job really well, you have to focus on quality over the quantity. And that's always God's method. To do that, you have to have extensions. So as the church body grows, you have to set people up with proper training deacons, elders, whatever those may be, so that you can have ministry happening to those people that you're not able to reach as one person. That's the only way that the church will flourish. Those people will go out and gather status on the health of the members and go back to the pastor so that he can understand where the flock is at. Works just like the sheep metaphor. 
he is always one step ahead of the flock regarding the culture. When this sheep and all my sheep are going this direction and I'm leading them, I'm out front, right? And if I see that there's a pack of wolves a quarter mile away and I can hear them, I've got to redirect all the sheep into another direction because the culture in that area is not good for the sheep. The sheep, I can't defend all of them. So I've got to get them in a different area. I've got to stand between the culture and the sheep. And the pastor must do the same thing. He's got to be an expert on the culture if he's to really lead the flock well and guide their minds in thinking correctly about where the Bible situates them and where the culture is trying to draw them, okay? On the end there, you know, I thought of this metaphor. It's okay if while I'm in surgery, I'm asleep. I, I want to be asleep during surgery. But it's not okay if I'm asleep during surgery and my surgeon is asleep too. That would be a problem. And so the pastor must be alert to the world around him. Each sheep is intimately known. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. It would be totally unheard of in Israel or in any Middle Eastern country for a shepherd not to understand the need of each and every sheep that he has to intimately know each one of them. You know, they say that shepherds from a couple thousand years back they would call each sheep by its name, and that sheep would respond to that shepherd's voice. They'd become accustomed to hearing that same voice, and they would go to you whenever that shepherd would call. There was a relationship that was built. I want to be careful how I say this, but I want to say that a shepherd, a pastor, when he deals with the people, the people should hear Jesus' voice through him. I'm not saying that he's Jesus or God or that he's infallible or doesn't make mistakes. What I'm saying is, as he transmits the word of God accurately, you should be able to pick up God in that. Your life should get better as a result of what's being said. When you follow that pastor's lead, you should be following Christ. You've got a Bible to check it anyway, right? Your health should be getting better. Finally, there's a very interesting metaphor. Um, it's called passing under the rod. You know, the shepherd had his, his crook and his rod. And so as the sheep would come in each day, right? This, this is like the high point for me. You wouldn't carry him like this, but I'm going to. The sheep would come in and they would, they would go into the gate and he would make them pass under the rod and he would count each and every sheep so that none are lost. But the sheep, you pick it up and you'd get an examination. You have to check his ears, check his, his face, check his eyes for infection. If he steps on a thorn and it gets infected, he's not gonna lose a leg, he's going to die. It's just a sheep. Each sheep got an examination and was intimately known. That requires that the pastor, the shepherd, had to know what kind of diseases sheep were susceptible to so that he could understand how to work with this animal, right? And diagnose it and you know, get a, a solution going for it, right? So a pastor must understand the needs of the congregation and has to be able to be in tune with where they're at and what their needs are. And if he doesn't have a skill set in a certain area, he can find somebody with that skill set and plug them into that person's life. I'm gonna put this guy down. All right. I've got the word TV there. If you or somebody you know is one of those people who goes to church by watching church TV, that's not God's plan. I'm not saying we can't get biblical truth from radio programs or YouTube videos or church TV, right? But that's not passing under a rod. That's not being counted. That's not having somebody work with you where you're at. That's not being accountable. You know, Paul and I meet every Monday, every Monday for accountability. He and I, we're watching out for each other. How are you doing? You know, how are you doing? Have you been angry? What have you said today? How are you treating the family? How's work going? You being honest on the job, David? Everything going on, we're sharing this information to make sure there's a check and balance. And without that, I'm able to fly under the radar. But if I got my shepherd there and he's watching out for me, asking me the hard questions, and Paul is crazy. Paul will look you in the eye with his blue eyes and just stare at you and it's almost like I'm being honest Paul stop looking at me like that it's like he's reading me or something you know but that's his job the shepherd needs to look at me like that and provide that kind of care right 
We've all been to churches where you can't even get that close to the pastor. I don't think that's healthy. I don't think that's what you see here in the Bible. <coughs> Keep watching church on TV, but get plugged into a place where the pastor has access to you. That's my point here. Status, this role is still active. This role is not going away, okay? What about the teacher? Everything I say about the teacher here is also true of the pastor. Definition, they taught the boundaries and doctrines of Christianity to those coming from pagan religions after the apostles died. It's a very necessary role. Uh, their job is to break down complex truths and simplify them for the people. And they are committed to local assemblies. I want to be careful not to pass judgment inappropriately, but the teacher in the local church has to be in the local church, situated here, assessing the needs of what's going on so they can prepare what needs to be taught to the people based on what they understand. If I just travel around, we don't have that intimate connection where we can feed off of each other and what needs to take place. So develop teaching based on discovered needs of the group. That involves not just teaching on Sundays, but really starting to get to know the people, finding out what are in people's minds, what are they facing, what do we need to help people with. That's the role of a teacher. They must be more knowledgeable on subjects than those they are teaching. True. How impressed would you be if I came up here and said, I'd like to teach you today that two added to two is actually four. Nobody would be impressed, and I don't blame you. Sometimes we need those reminders, hopefully not that one, but when I say more knowledgeable, there's all kind of people. Some people have lived more years than me in this room. I would never say that I have more experience than you. Your experience, your wisdom, is not something I can tamper with. That is yours. You can teach me. But when we're talking about specific subjects, I go back and dig in order to get as much information on something because you may not have time to do that so I can give you a perspective that you might not be in position to get on your own. That's the role of the teacher. Teaching has more authority than prophecy, right? If somebody stands up now and says, I've got a word for you, David, the Lord says such and such. I don't blindly take that. The teacher goes into the Bible and says, well, let's dissect this. Let's see what's actually being said here. So God's prophecy, by the way, never causes confusion. It edifies. So when you get somebody that says, God is telling me to tell you to give $1,000, how can I validate that in the Bible, that God told you to tell me to give $1,000? That's not really the type of prophetic utterances I think that God would be telling us. I have a story, I don't have time for it now, maybe I do. I was about to go do something I shouldn't do 20 years ago, a long time, right? And it, it wasn't, it's, I don't wanna say it wasn't a major sin, it was like I was, I was going to work with my friend who was not a Christian to do something in a way that I shouldn't. I was trying to kind of blend in with him to try to pull him along to Jesus and it just wasn't the right thing to do, you know? And I knew it, and I didn't tell my wife, I didn't tell anybody. So I'm on my way to my friend's house, or, or after work. So at work, a lady walks up to me, and she says, hi, my name is so-and-so. I said, hey, I'm David. She said, I don't know if you believe in prophecy, but I have a message for you, and you can decide if it's true or not. And she says, friendship with the world is the enemy of God. That's James chapter four, and that's true, I know that. And then she said, you're about to go do something today that you know you shouldn't do. <laughs> That's a prophecy. Not give me your thousand dollars. That's a prophecy. And guess what? I didn't go to that person's house, right? And I left well enough alone, okay? Teaching is the primary means of grace in the church. That's kind of, it, it almost sounds, you know, like where are you going with that? Teaching is the way to take what the Bible is saying about how you and Jesus connect in everyday life and to make that plain and understandable so that you can have an enhanced relationship with Jesus. That's it. Um, but, but taking the scriptures, which is the picture of God, it is our life, and opening that up, that is where we get grace for life. Teachers must be constant learners and refiners of the gift. A teacher that doesn't learn anymore is no longer able to teach because they've stopped learning, right? Um, constant learners and refiners of the gift. To come up here, you've got to take all this information. Oftentimes, I'm, I'm not bragging, I'm just trying to show you the process. 
I might go through 80 books to get down to just 30 to 40 minutes of material to give you. Some might have to say, this is good, but not now. This is good, that's bad, I don't want that. And just kind of construct and make sure that what I'm saying is accurate, right? Um, refining it, condensing it, and then distilling it down to something that makes sense. This is what a teacher has to do to be using their gift well. They are masters of biblical theology and systematic theology. Biblical theology is tracing God's story of redemption from Genesis all the way to Revelation. Once you know what God is trying to do start to finish, you won't go David Koresh. You won't go wrong on some weird angles because you understand the flow of the argument. Now you can't only do biblical theology because you'll be stuck in Genesis like our Bible study group is for like 36 weeks now, right? Um, so you've got to have systematic. You've got to say the statement or the question, what is faith? What is salvation? Who is Jesus? Where do we get revelation from? That is systematic theology because we take the Bible to answer those questions so that we can live our lives according to the way he wants us to live. A teacher has to understand both. I didn't always understand that, and I was just happy I learned this little nugget and I wanted to give it to somebody else. But that was kind of the backwards approach to helping people grow with God. He doesn't want us to get little nuggets. He wants all of us to understand how the whole thing works. So when we talk to other people, we are the intelligent Christians that he asks us to be and knowledgeable about our faith. Sometimes Christians or other people talk to us as Christians and we know nothing about the scriptures. And they say, you want me to be a Christian, but you know nothing about the book yourself. How valuable do you actually feel that it is? And it, you know, it's kind of embarrassing, right? God wants us to know these things. They are able to provide pastoral counseling on everyday life needs. Everything that we learn in the Bible has to translate into needs of everyday living. That's where we're at. We live our Monday through Saturday daily decisions. What decision do I make? I'm not just going to pray for you. We're going to look at that, Raphael. We're going to decide, is there anything in the scripture that gives us a direction on what God might want done, right? So they're able to take it and apply it to people's lives. Status is active. Teachers are still here. Let me give you a note on sheep and shepherds. Sheep are very dumb animals, they tell us. A sheep can get turned over like this. It's called being turned. And that thing cannot get back on its other side. That's where the term, I think, rock in a hard place comes from. A wolf sees this, hears the whining, and just takes off, right? This thing is helpless. He needs a shepherd. To say that somebody is a pastor and that you are sheep is not to imply that anybody in here is dumb. They tell me on National Geographic that humans are as intelligent as a porpoise or a chimp, right? No, we are the most intelligent creatures on the earth. And a pastor does not undermine and condescend to people, he builds them up. So I don't come to you to tell you I can't learn from you. I need your feedback from everything I say, everything I'm saying now, right? Shepherds, David said, David was king shepherd over Israel, right? And in that role, he was supposed to lead them to God to give them an accurate picture of God. But he also said, the Lord is my shepherd. Every pastor is under God's leadership. Every pastor has to be you know, checked and balanced on everything. That's why we all have a Bible so that we can weigh that out. All right, so the final part of this, and we're wrapping up. I know I've given you a lot of technical information, but I think it's necessary to level set on those roles. Let's do a quick thought experiment. So. God's authoritative truth is not in the pastor or the teacher, but it is the Bible itself. True. We all have our own Bibles. True. Therefore, we all have God's authoritative truth for ourselves. Also true. If we all have our own Bibles, do we really need pastors and teachers? I used to think, no, we don't. Many years ago, right? What happens? Let's just do this. What happens if None of us show up here, and we have no teaching, no pastor or anything. We're all just reading our Bibles at home. We all learn very different at different speeds. We're going to pick up different parts of the Bible. We're going to misunderstand a lot of things, and we're going to turn those into doctrines, and we're going to start to live by some of these things, as I once did, right? And when we come back together, we have division, disunity, and chaos, and God is not the author of chaos. You may remember Paul in 1 Corinthians. It's an out-of-order church, 
And he says, every one of you has a doctrine. Everybody's got a song to sing. Everybody's got a revelation. Everybody's got a different tongue. He's trying to get them to say, if you're so spiritual, why don't you recognize that anything that God is doing promotes unity, not division? See that? So in our thought experiment, we would say, yes, we have the true Bible, the truth of God, but pastors and teachers gather us together on Sundays so that we're all learning on the same page the same things. And you can always ask the teacher and the pastor where they got that information from. It's not like they're God and you have to listen to only what they say. You've got a Bible. All right. The purpose was for equipping the saints for the work of ministry for the building up of the body of Christ. Here's the breakdown. Equipping of the saints. What are we equipped for? The work of the ministry. And what constitutes the work of the ministry? Bodybuilding. Building the body. Not only bringing new people to Jesus, but helping each other grow. That's the very important task of every Christian. Pastors and teachers feed the larger body, the group. They, in turn, build up each other, right? If you see, in a church, failure to build up the body, you've got to go back to the people and say they're not feeding each other. They have fights and they divide and they don't talk to each other anymore. Or there's one guy who's got to be the leader and he's off on the side teaching people the wrong stuff, whatever. All of that stems from pastors and teachers not doing their job effectively. God gave us these gifts so that we would understand who he is. Remember, it wasn't just enough to have unity, but who he is, how to nurture each other, and how to engage the world around us. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Not just the unity with each other, but the unity in the faith. Not Thomas More's idea, but God at the center point of all of our unity. Knowledge. It says, so we come to the knowledge of the Son of God. That means to come into an intimate awareness of Jesus' character, what he did with his life, his ministry and what it involved, how deep is his love, what is his desire, what does he expect from you, what should you expect from him, and what promise has he promised you. Until we all get on that page, it's kind of hard to work together. I'm not saying that we're not on the right track in that direction or that we're not close. I'm just saying that these are the things that have to be instilled in us in order for us to become this full man under the head of Christ. It's a mature man, fully grown body of Christ, and it's un united in both love and in belief as defined in the Bible. So I'm going to give you some questions. I see sometimes we take pictures. You might want to take pictures. Um, does the importance of knowing your Bible increase knowing that apostles and prophets are no longer here? If the Bible replaces what the apostles and prophets did, how important is your Bible to you, really? How do the ideas of loving rightly and believing rightly support each other? What happens if you take either one of those away? What do you understand about the roles of pastors and teachers that you did not know before as a result of the lesson? What could you change in your life that would enhance your ability to benefit from what God is doing for you through pastors and teachers? And lastly, how should your commitment to love influence you when a pastor or a teacher makes a mistake in their role? Pastors don't make mistakes, right? And that's why this question is irrelevant. You've got to be prepared to understand what kind of makes mistakes are fatal, like David Koresh mistakes, versus what kind of mistakes you need to be forgiving toward the leader. It's a hard job being a leader, and we've got to be prayerful for our leaders, merciful toward them like Jesus is merciful to us. We're all supposed to get along together in love and unity centered around the truth of Jesus, okay? So when trouble comes amongst each other, we feed each other, we forgive each other because he forgave us. But when the leader might get it wrong, as I do sometimes, you come up to me. Orby is really good with coming up to me and letting me know I disagree and it's okay because he often has some good points that I have overlooked because he's always reading his Bible. He's an asset to the church. 
He's not reading all the books that I am, but the guy knows his Bible, and he's an asset. I'll stop it right there, and I just want to encourage us to uh, be praying for the leadership in this church and engaging in the ministries that are being offered and praying for God to open up the right opportunities for us. 